welcome to episode 84 of Webflow. I'm your host, Jack, your failure connoisseur, and today my guest is Uros Mikic. He's the founder and CEO of Flow Ninja Studio, an award-winning Webflow agency, and he's worked with the likes of Upwork and Checkout.com. Since 2015, they have successfully led more than 100 Webflow projects worldwide, and he, ha- he now has a team of 40 people in Serbia. They have products like Datagoat and more, so they're not just doing client work, they're also doing products too. And Urosh has an incredible YouTube channel where he shares stories behind building the biggest Webflow hub and an in-house team. So check it out if you want to leverage website strategy, anything Webflow related, to be honest, uh, it's well worth checking out. Now, I actually have met Orosh in person. He gave me this insanely strong drink called Rakia at the Webflow London meetup last year. It's made from pears. It's insanely strong. So be careful if you meet him in person, you may well get the same gift. So he's flying high, but has it always been this way? The failures that we'll talk about are scaling his team too fast, his management style, or potentially how he needed to improve as a manager when he first started managing more people, and his office. So, Urosh, welcome to the Webflow podcast. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you for the invitation. And I mean, like 84 episodes, I think that there is a statistic that like most podcasts get like three or four episodes recorded and then they stop there. So you're also doing an incredible job keeping this up. So thank you so much. Hey, that's really, really kind of you to say. Yes, it takes a lot of dedication and consistency. But if you love what you do, then you keep doing it. Speaking of loving what you do, I feel like you're similarly minded with Flow Ninja. You are a very young founder. How old are you? I'm currently 24, so I guess you're lucky because my birthday is in in May, so like I can be young, even younger for this podcast. <laughs> when we're talking, <laughs> it sounds about even it. sounds even more impressive. Yeah, yeah. But correct. I mean, Flow Ninja has been around since 2015, so it's a while. Yeah, it's it's a while. I mean, you're young, but you started insanely young in in the Webflow space, and then you've kind of ridden this wave as it as it seems from, um, you know, Webflow being at the start, you got clients initially from Upwork, I believe. And then you've kind of grown from there to actually then create the Upwork website like that in, in my head, I'm just like, that is a mental rise. Tell me, like, bring us back to the start, bring us back to young Urosh, super hungry and trying to get clients. I imagine on your own, just bring us back to that place yeah. and what what drove you. Yeah, so I think probably even getting before actually getting clients is like where my story started. Just because I came from a family where we didn't have a lot, but like my parents were working a lot. I don't know, like my, my father was working from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then like afterwards even more just to kind of provide for us enough so we didn't feel left out because like from my childhood, I was always having the same things as all of the other kids. Uh, but probably not on the same terms because like my parents were busting their asses off like 12 hour work days just for me to kind of go on like kind of school trips with everybody and stuff like that. So from a pretty young age, I, I guess I saw that you need to work a lot in order to get anything. And I saw that uh, potentially I don't want to work like uh, like my, my parents, like in, in terms of the capacity and kind of how much they were working like in their older ages, like, I don't know, like when they were 40 and stuff like that, and they were still kind of busting their ass off uh, every single day, every single week, every single month and stuff like that. Um, and like, that's where I actually started working at their fruit shop because like we were selling fruit and like for anybody not knowing Serbia, like at that point, Serbia was not so developed. So we we're basically selling food on the street because our food market is on the street. And like, I was basically going and learning sales, how I like to look at it nowadays, because I needed to sell, um, I don't know, berries. And then like when a grandma comes in and asks me for berries, I'm like, oh, this morning I woke up at five and picked them up in my in my uh, kind of land and whatever, and then brought them over and stuff like that. So just that more and more people started liking me, but I feel like that's the place where I saw the most differentiation between my brother. He's also like our CTO. He's more into work and me, which are more people oriented because I never felt bad actually working on or like selling. I was always happy and I was always attacking people, laughing and like just trying to test them out and see what's going to actually work so they buy more. So 
just because of that, I had an idea of kind of how much you need to work to earn ten dollars at that point, like to go ahead and gonna have like anything for school, and that's where my drive, I think, kind of started and kind of moved, uh, kind of afterwards to like even even today, I guess that I'm not stopping because I'm always scared of that we need to get more because I I don't want my my kids to see me maybe. Uh, struggled out a lot and like that I don't have time to spend with them as much as I would like to. Wow, what a fascinating story. Okay, a few things that I think are worth saying there. It sounds like you realized the power of relationship building, even at a young age in that fruit store, you know, maybe repeat customers are the most valuable customers. Like you learn people's names, you have a rapport with them, you know, you learn what makes them tick and maybe how that they're going to actually like potentially give you more money, what, what they value upsell on berries yeah you know two for one <laughs> hey how are you doing mr grigetsky or whatever you know like you're kind of building that rapport and then also working with your family i think is a really interesting thing to learn at a young age you know that you're kind of in the trenches together and that you learn how to to work hard but work hard as a team and it's really cool to hear that you're currently working with your brother i didn't actually realize that so that's really fascinating yeah. Are there any other insights that I've missed out there from from that early age? Because that's such a formative period of your life. Yeah, I think I was like 13, something like that, when that actually 12, 13, when that started. And like, even today, somebody's going to say it's child labor, but I'm like, the most grateful thing ever is that my parents made me do that at a young age, that I actually realized how the world works. And it's not like all, hey, you're going to finish college, and you're going to get a job, but that you need to actually work for that. And I guess since then I had a lot of different things. I mean, like I, I was creating parties. Uh, I was like the party that I created and branded. That's, I guess, when I realized branding, uh, we created a, like a whole party and like branded it in a specific way and stuff like that. And we had more than 300 people showing up to like parties that we created. I always try to kind of learn something new and like the, just to try to apply it and to go all the way in. Like, because like for those parties, like all of other kids were creating those, but they were super small and stuff like that. But when I created something, I wanted to be the best. I wanted the party to be the biggest, and like the the that people are want that that they're gonna want to come back to something like that. So that was also a fun period when I was earning kind of. I started earning nice money from that, but then they kind of wanted to beat me up, and I realized nah, probably not a fun fun period for my life because I mean like you're gonna throw a kid out because they weren't good, but then they're gonna wait you after the party to go ahead and kind of beat you up because you throw them out. So it was a fun uh, kind of growing experience to get those things. So I was like, okay, let's find something new. And then afterwards, I picked up Instagram, actually, uh, the moment when Instagram actually just started becoming popular. And I was really lucky because at that point, there were no Instagram tactics or good content. You were just basically following a thousand people one day and following them the next day, following the next thousand people the next day, and just doing that reverse proxy process. Uh, reverse proxy process, yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> talking about Webflow. Uh, and because of that, like I had an Instagram with more than 200,000 followers. That's where I created my first online store to sell something to those followers. Initially, it was actually WordPress before Webflow. That's where I was uh, really uh, frustrated about the platform because I could not do anything. At that moment, I didn't know PHP and I wanted to create everything custom. And that's kind of how I slowly stumbled upon the Webflow, slowly started freelancing first on Fiverr and then on Upwork afterwards. Damn. Okay, so we went from berries to... Uh, parties to Instagram to web development. Is that yeah. the kind of the steps? That is wild. Okay, so essentially you found Webflow because you were actually having pain points with WordPress yeah. and you were like, oh my God, there's this platform that I can do stuff with and I didn't even know that it was going to be nearly as easy as this. And then you transitioned to actually, instead of creating just an online store and doing e-commerce, you were like, oh, I could actually create websites for other people. How did that bit come in? Yeah, so actually I got scared because the Instagram algorithm changed. That's when the Instagram algorithm changed from chronological to like just like having an actual algorithm. So my like my, my Instagram account like had 200K followers and like maybe 50, 60,000 people saw every single post. And after that, like only 10,000 people saw the post. I was like, okay, fuck this. I'm not going to touch this. I'm going to go broke. And then I sold that store for almost $3,000, which in today's market, that would be worth a lot, I think. But uh, as a young kid, I was scared. That was a lot of money for me. I sold it. And that's how I realized, okay, I need to do something new. 
And that's where I kind of slowly started getting into freelancing and doing the freelance work. And that was on Upwork initially to, to start. Yeah, that was actually first on Fiverr. And then like the clients on Fiverr were like websites for a hundred bucks. So I was basically having an hourly rate of probably $1 of kind of the amount of time I've spent creating websites. But uh, instead of thinking, let me learn Webflow and try to sell it to somebody, my pin point was if somebody pays me a hundred bucks, I need to deliver the website. So I'm going to work day in and day out uh, to go ahead and deliver it. So I did uh, a reverse path of actually selling the website first and then figuring out what the heck did I actually do and let me figure out how to do it properly. Wow. Okay. Can we just, let's just take stock for a second. Okay. Okay. You were a young kid, you're 13 years old. You learned the value of hard work. You learned how to communicate really well. And it sounds like you had a fire up your ass that most teenagers did not have because you didn't want to have the same life that your parents had. You wanted to really work on something that you found fulfilling and that that really lit you up. And you also realized that you had this kind of all in attitude to stuff that you could leverage. You know, there's kind of two major things that anyone has in their control, which is the effort that they put in and the amount of kind of tenacity they have to, to actually follow through and get that thing done. And it sounds like you had both of those two things in abundance, even if you didn't necessarily have the financial support at that time of your life. But tell me a little bit about like what drives you to not just have, you know, you were doing Fiverr, you were doing Upwork, and it sounds like you were growing a pretty good business at that point, right? Like you're on your own, you're doing your thing. Awesome. But what then drives you to be like, you know what, I'm going to grow something way bigger. Like there's one thing to be really, really driven and to to want to own your life. And it sounds like you were doing that at that point to then be like, okay, and now I'm going to grow something that's even bigger than me. Tell me about that thought process. What's going on there? Yeah, so I really like uh, kind of the Alex Hormozis podcast when he says it's like life is a game and like you just need to figure out how you want to play it. And for me, I always wanted to play it on a harder level. Level. So like even with the agency today, and like at that point, when whenever I hit the moment where like the game becomes easy of like, hey, I woke up, I worked six hours, I'm done, I don't have anything else to do. I knew exactly what I need to do for like, let's say a client, like they sent some, they said something for me and I was like, I exactly know what they need to do. That's when I started realizing, let me figure out what next do I need to do? And like, what was the next challenge I need to commit to in order to kind of keep pushing and keep kind of having that, that fire inside of me. Uh, like recently, like one of my favorite books is like uh, the man's search for purpose. And because of that, I do feel like that it's not about actually being the best or like being uh, kind of the most powerful person in the world or whatever. It's more about that constant pursuit for purpose. And that is the thing that kind of, for me, basically drives me to continue further is the more I explore, the more I invest into the business, into personal relationships, into travel and like whatever, I continuously have that sense of purpose and like that I'm searching the sense of purpose because I guess you're never going to find it. And that's probably the thing that drives me and like that is uh, kind of uh, that's helping me to grow further, to test more things and not to feel bad when I actually fail uh, in the end. Mm, interesting. So there's this kind of consistent, what's the next level once you yeah. reach that level? And that growth is the thing that is driving you more than the outcome itself. Because sometimes people have like outcome based goals, like I want to earn x amount by this stage or i want to be you know seen as this person in society or whatever but what you're saying is it's more like you have process based goals you want to continuously reach whatever that next level is and you're not fearful of actually reaching that level or not you're just more focused on let's just do the steps to actually move in the right direction and as long as i'm doing that then that is the thing that seems to motivate you is that is that fair yeah, and like for every single time when I whenever I do something, like the only time I feel bad is if I did not give it my all. And that's kind of consistently the the thing I'm kind of striving for is like whatever I do, like uh, whatever I want to do, I want to make sure that I gave 100% of my effort and 100% of my time and like that there is no work left to be done when, when I like to say it like that. And even if it fails in that case, I'm not going to feel bad. Like I'm usually feeling bad when something fails in the studio or whatever, uh, but I saw it coming and I did not react because maybe I was lazy at that point or maybe I didn't sleep well for a week or whatever. Like 
I just didn't react for it. And that, that's usually how I like to look at things is like, just make sure to give it your all. And even if uh, maybe last month, February was like our best month ever in business. And I didn't feel special at all, just because I know that we did not give it our all and that we have a lot more things to optimize and fix into the studio in order for that to actually be good. Because like the outcome uh, for me, it's not really relatable. It's more about what we're doing and kind of how can we get there and kind of what are the things we're doing from our side in order to get to the goal itself. Hmm. It sounds like a bit of a blessing and a curse that you feel like that, you know, because sometimes it's hard to celebrate the small wins when you're like, well, could have done this, could have done this, could have done this. I know we got here, but we, we there was so much more to do. Does that does that worry you at all? Does that make you think, God, like this is affecting my happiness? Or like how do you how do you kind of see that? Yeah, I I guess I'm never you're never stopping working. No, I mean like not actually physically. I'm like I'm working a lot less than I was working like at any point in my life. Honestly, like at this point, it's more about that. Like right now, with that sense of thinking, you're consistently thinking about the business. Like you might be working like I don't know today I might be working like four hours probably because I cranked out all the work over the week. But like the other, the rest of the day, yes, you're going to be doing some other things. You're going to go to the gym or whatever, but you're going to consistently just kind of be thinking about a business and like, what can you do? What did you miss this week? What you're going to plan for next week? How are you going to plan the next quarter? Who you need to reach out? Did you forget something? And like, yeah, it's, it's a blessing that you can have more free time, like as the business gets bigger and like as uh, you grow the business, but it's also of course, because you feel responsible for other people and also you feel responsibility on your side, kind of just for me, like as a person uh, to do my best. So you're probably going to be thinking a lot more about uh, uh, kind of like the business and like a lot more about the problems and like the things you want to do in the business itself. Fascinating. Okay. So we've got a kind of 30,000 foot view of how you're looking at Flow Ninja and how you operate. Okay. This is the question that I get asked a lot in DMs. How do you get your first clients? You've already told us that you started on Fiverr and Upwork. Can you give any advice about, you know, a young web flower that's hungry to start, learn from you? How should they go about getting their first clients in your opinion? So I think Upwork and Fiverr are probably the best cases. Like if, like usually people are going to say friends and family and yeah, yeah, I've gotten clients from that, from that side, but that's not a direct uh, thing. Like, hey, you can do this. Uh, when it comes to Upwork, I was actually like, even for that, when I was working uh, kind of on Upwork as a freelancer, I was going all the way in reading blogs, like you have blogs, you have YouTube channels, you have books on how to get your upper client. Like uh, you, you wouldn't believe like how much people time are they spending on kind of how to identify that. And from like those things, I was starting to slowly uh, learn how Upwork, for example, as a platform works and how can you actually get messages like and replies back. So there were things of like, hey, when you open up a job, go ahead and uh, on the bottom, see the reviews for the client. And that's the place where they're going to have their name. So Instead of saying, hey, a client, name, hey, client, or whatever, or hey, thank you for inviting me, you can go on Upwork in the review section and you can find the name of the client because probably a previous freelancer said, hey, Jack is a really cool person. I would love to work with him like again. So I was starting my messages, hey, Jack. Then like the next thing is I go ahead and figure out where do you live. And then I go on news and see uh, kind of what's happening in your area, maybe like from boring thing that is raining for the, like, maybe there is a really fun game in uh, like either NFL, like, because we had US customers that you can write about, like that you feel like some, some, somebody like that would like. So then you write that. And then like, if a client is reading the message, they're like, Hey, they know my name. Then they actually figure out where is my location. Okay. They care about it. And then the final part is I usually recorded videos. So for every single of the, one of the applications that I've done, I've recorded a video. Uh, at that time, Loom wasn't available. So I was basically recording myself, getting it from my phone to my laptop, uploading to YouTube unlisted, getting the unlisted link, and then adding it to the proposal itself uh, to send uh, kind of a video like, hey, Jack, thank you so much for uh, like the opportunity. I created a short POC, and then I designed something for free and created how would something like this look like. And if, if even 100 people apply, probably two are going to do something like that. And then it's not going to matter, do you have reviews or do you not have reviews? It's a lot of work, and I think I sent a hundred of those videos before I got my first client, but I just didn't stop. I was like, okay, this is the only way I feel like I can get a client. And then like, if you send a hundred of those kind of really customized proposals for clients you feel like you can deliver good work for, I'm sure you would get a job. But it's still like a month or two months of process of actually probably sitting four hours a day every single time. And that's technically doing cold outreach to clients on Upwork. 
paying for connects because like you're today you're probably gonna need to invest some money to buy the connects on the upwork app itself and that way you can uh kind of grow the accounts and like grow the like to to get some of your first clients awesome awesome advice there and i think that applies also for outside of upwork too like um you know actually cold if you're cold outreaching people you know, putting in some effort, showing your face on a Loom video or whatever, and and making sure that you're seen as like a real person that actually cares about that human that you are contacting. Because ultimately, um, we all just want to be feeling cared for, don't we? But yeah, great advice there. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so we've set the scene. You've got 40 person team in Serbia. We're now going to dig into how the hell that happened and all the ups and downs along the way. Are you ready? to dig into your failures. I'm ready. Let's get ready to rumble. (laughs) Okay, tell me about failure number one, scaling the team too fast. Yeah, so I feel like uh, as you start getting clients, you're like, hey, let me just hire anybody and not think about what the heck do you need to do with people like afterwards. And there's a whole different uh, area of operations, HR and people management behind it. Like a funny story is when I started the agency, I hired uh, a designer and she actually quit after one week of working with me. So that's like, if we take a look at it from the ground up, like that's one of my biggest failure is that somebody could not spend a week with me and not quit afterwards. So you, can you imagine how frustrated was somebody to spend a week with me and like say, I'm quitting this, there is nowhere near I'm going to be kind of working at the, at the studio itself. So you can go from there to managing 40 people. So it's it, it just takes a lot of book reading and a lot of uh, kind of uh, self-reflection uh, in, in that point. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so why did she quit after a week? Can you, can you give us a little bit of an insight yeah, there? Uh, I mean... I thought that like uh, if I'm hiring somebody, they know everything that they need to do. I'm paying them to do it. So I was like, hey, I have a client. I, th- there is a website that needs to be done. And then I just sent all of the uh, like briefs. And every single day I was like, what did you do? And she was like, nothing. How did you, how did you do nothing today? But from my perspective, I didn't give any clarification. And I didn't have one of my biggest learnings that I have today is that uh, if you're going to hire somebody, specifically somebody which is not senior, you're probably going to need a lot more time to do it with them than if you would do it alone. And like that's one of the first realizations I figured out is, hey, when I hire people who are not senior, I'm probably going to need eight hours of work to finish a task I would do on my own for four hours. But that is the only thing which is going to allow me to scale the team further and to kind of transfer the knowledge. And like my unique perspective of why clients are paying me over to them so that they can actually start delivering the service. Yeah, I think there's this awkward period, isn't it, when you first start hiring people and you think, oh God, they're gonna they're gonna take some weight off my shoulders. Like straight away. They're just gonna help so much because they're just gonna fill that gap that I need desperately filled. And actually, I think what happens is there's this strange period where you need to invest even more time of time that maybe you don't have or you don't want to prioritize but you need to invest even more time to make sure that there's systems and processes in place for someone to actually be able to do the job that you need them to do like and there's a lot of hand holding and a lot of kind of investment of time to give that person the tools resources they need skill sets that they need in order to actually fill that hole for you but if you manage to get through that awkward period what I've found is that you then have that need filled and and that they can actually do that job. But there's, I think there's this misconception, like you hire someone to do the job and they just do the job. And, and that's not always the case is what I've found. Is that fair? Yeah. And even when you hire more senior people, like I, I think at the moment we're kind of onboarding a chief revenue officer and I know that I'm going to need to spend a lot of time with him because I need to decom- decompile the whole company that he's going to help us kind of run into the future kind of when it comes to sales and marketing. And even though he knows a lot more than me in sales and marketing, I'm going to need to spend a lot of time in order to explain how do people work, how do people think, how we sell to clients, which are our clients, how do we usually interact with them, them that maybe he has a great idea, but we cannot go with that idea directly because we've never had an approach like that with clients. There's like, the, as the company gets bigger and bigger, like even when you onboard senior people, you're going to need even more time to onboard them than you would need uh, kind of for somebody more junior because like they're going to need to know a lot more about a company in order to do their job properly. I completely hear you, yeah. I mean, like, in fact, maybe you need to invest even more time in someone doing a more complicated job because that's a more critical role to get right. Can I ask you a little, this may be a bit of a personal question, but you're obviously very young. 
you're hiring people of all sorts of different ages and a lot of them seem to be seem to be older than you judging by their facial hair on the youtube videos that i've watched how do you approach hiring do, was it hard at the start to actually hire someone that had more skills than you and maybe more experience and be like hey this is kind of awkward because i'm in charge but i need your help and expertise and then i mean how did you kind of manage that as you as you scaled yeah, so I mean, like I've made mistakes there also because in English there is like, do you have another word for friends? Because like in Serbia we have like a friend, and then we have another word where it's uh like it's actually a friend, but it's not a close friend kind of to you. I'm not sure. Like, is there any uh, word in English for that? Uh, I mean, if they're like a worker, they're a colleague, so they're not really a. F- well, they can be friends, but you can say. Yeah, let's mate see. is what Let, I generally go with. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, like, you can say that I was thinking of like people who I was hiring like that to be my mates, like something more personal. Uh, okay. Let's say personal, but then you need to realize, hey, they're just your kind of friend colleagues, and that's how you need to keep the authority, which is pretty mm. hard because, from one perspective, you're onboarding so many like-minded people into your company that you really want to be friends with and I just want to spend time with. But also on the other side, you need to still have the authority in order to run the business. Because like, if you get too caught up in emotions, you're probably going to start running your business pretty, pretty bad, badly. So that's where I feel like with time, I had also not a depression side, but I was also having a pretty bad side of me of thinking, how could they do this? How could they do that? Or, like they didn't remember me for this or like uh, just thinking about people as like my mates. But then with time, I, I realized, hey, I need to actually separate these two. And I need to look at people in my company differently. I really love them and I really appreciate them, but there just needs to be a little bit of a different approach when it comes to that in order to run the business successfully. And you can still have a great time with them. You can travel, you can do whatever the heck you want to uh, go out and stuff like that. But there's just like that small shift in the mindset that you need to have, which is going to allow you to say things in management where somebody doesn't do a good job that you are going to be uh, like fully transparent when saying that. And like not thinking, what is my friend going to think of me? Or like, what is my mate going to think of me when I say to him, like, why did you do this? Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I didn't really think about it like that because I've never had a team. And uh, I imagine there's a fine line between hiring someone that's like-minded and has, you know, is a good personality fit for the business and has the kind of traits that you want that fits with your company culture. But then also recognizing that there needs to be some kind of hierarchy so that, you know, like where does the buck stop like what who's like where does responsibility stop and start for particular job roles and but then if you're going for like a barbecue at their house on the weekend like okay cool but let's just be conscious <laughs> yeah with, with yeah, colleagues we're... first other, rather mm. than mates first type thing i guess yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're doing that like once per month like i have the leadership team i, I cook them steaks and stuff like that so I still have that environment, but it's also just like the mindset of like approaching people is when it changes a little bit, you feel better and you don't feel bad if somebody doesn't like something pretty badly or whatever. Yeah. I guess it's like this phrase that companies use. It's like, we're a family, but it's like, no, we're not because I am paying you to do a job. I don't pay my, well, I actually did pay my brother to do this podcast with me, but, (laughs) but you know, I don't, I don't pay I don't know, my mom to iron my soul, like, I don't know, whatever, you know, like a particular job role. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, family is a very different thing. And and I think this whole, like, where's the line blur and making sure that there's a clear difference between the two is really, really important. Yeah. Even though you can be friendly, but yeah, just being conscious of that. And then Tell also, me about, like, like, just oh, sorry. G- getting back to, like, the, the hiring thing, kind of hiring too quickly. Uh, I guess I did not learn with time, actually, that uh, like you quickly forget. Like now I know it, but like I had to make the same mistake a lot of times in order before I actually was uh, kind of le- leading the right people. Afterwards, I, I started becoming a better, like a uh, better manager of uh, kind of leading people, but I was hiring the wrong people. So like we had more work. We were like, hey, let's bring people over. Like we brought people off the street, which did not go through the proper interview process they kind of messed up client projects. Then we had to work double the hours kind of internally uh, to fix their stuff. And then also we hired too quickly when it comes to kind of freelancers, because like at one point our opinion was, hey, we're fully in-house, which we are at the moment. And I'm like, we're not working with any freelancers, but like, and like our motto was that, but the moment when we started having more work, we're like, hey, let's maybe sprinkle in a few freelancers here and there. 
and like which is probably fine but our business was not created in a way to kind of work with freelancers when it comes to processes and sops and kind of like the whole company culture so that also was like a mistake where we lost a lot of money and uh, we basically maybe costed us also some of the clients but also mostly costed us our kind of like working hours and like that our internal team was uh, needing to work double the hours because me as a ceo was thinking hey i'm gonna fix your problem i'm gonna bring you five freelancers they're not gonna be familiar with the company the company is not created for them and then they're gonna ruin everything so i'm gonna be mad at them even like at the freelancers even though it maybe it wasn't their fault the team is gonna be mad at me because like now they need to do double the work uh, that they weren't planning to do and i'm like what what did just happen like over this over a span of a month wow okay yeah so is your advice then to because it seems to be that you've chosen the path look we're gonna ha- hire an in-house team we want to build something long term we want team members to know our systems inside out and the only way to do that is to have an in-house team rather than basically hire random freelancers for for various projects can you can you explain more about the thought process there because it seems to be a more expensive option you've probably got to pay pension schemes and all of that stuff so Tell me about that. Why are you doing that? I guess, uh, like, first thing is churn, because I, I guess that also has, like, a cost benefit on that front. Because, yes, we're paying a lot more for our team. Like, we're having a lot less profit than some of the other agencies, but also we have a lot less churn. So I'm not consistently stressed about who's going to be working the next project, because we have about one person quitting per year, which at 40 people is like a really, really tiny percentage. Like it's almost close to nothing. Uh, so looking at that, I think there are benefits of having a full tight team. But also when I, when I take a look at the profitability and scalability of the business, we would maybe have been a team of 100 people, like if we would uh, chose the kind of freelance route. Just because in order to go ahead and hire somebody, hire them legally, get a contract set up, get them onboarded to the team, uh, we have them probably just in the Balkan region because like we cannot expand to hire across the world because like we need somebody when they are in person from li- like the legal reasons and full time reasons uh, in Serbia like it's only possible to hire people from the Balkan region so that's gonna limit our growth a lot and which probably limited our growth a lot but in the end it came from one of my selfish things is like I wanted to provide back to the community and there is uh, like a small part of me which is really really happy and fulfilled. When I see somebody from our team members buying an apartment, buying a first car, uh, traveling to MotoGP, going to F1 uh, for the first time, like there are like a lot of fun things which are happening in the studio. Like we have babies coming in and out, like every at every single point, you're getting invited to those events to people, and like there is a sense of fulfillment. Hey, we're we're doing this for work, we're doing this for money, but in the end, you get a sense of kind of community in the end where you can you can see that your work actually contributed to somebody else's life in person, like in your country. And that that's what I feel like is something which drives me and like we, which helps me kind of push forward and kind of continue the, the, the mission on my side. Beautiful. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And uh, I guess it's more of a like a long-term play as well, like your company culture. I think companies don't necessarily have <laughs> like a culture if uh, it's completely remote everyone's working from anywhere no one really knows who's working on what um whereas you know if you're all in one place and you've got that consistency and you can you know support the people that you've that you've learned you know how they live and what they do for years that's that's a very fulfilling thing i'm sure yeah and to add i mean like i and to add to that like that people not to get like that people don't get me wrong there's no problems in hiring globally and kind of hiring freelancers but i do feel like if i was starting a business right now i would probably be able to hire freelancers efficiently and maybe build a small sense of culture and stuff like that but as this was my first business it like we might have been able to scale to 100 people but it would implode on its own i think at one point because i did not have the management skills to have to lead people remote uh, because there is a different set of skills that you need to learn and kind of acquire with time in order to kind of lead people who are not physically at your presence and like where that you need to realize are they struggling or they're not struggling and stuff like that so that's why I feel like it's also about which business you're starting. Is it your first business? Is it not your first business? And that's how you can take a look at, are you going to go remote first or you're going to go hybrid and going to have in-house team, uh, but like they're going to be seeing each other like once per month or something like that. Speaking of, tell me about failure number two, your management style. Yes. So I was, uh, I think even to this day, sometimes uh, you can forget about uh, how much 
whatever you say impacts people and uh, you can get really really busy with like uh, like, let's say with 40 people like uh, like 40 clients and stuff like that you get into the weeds without actually figuring out hey these people are actually people so um, I, I think every six months I read back the book, How, How to Win Friends and Influence People, just because I feel like there are a lot of management books that I've read, but that is the only book that actually helps me get back to the base point and realize I need to care about people. So I need to care about them like personally to figure out what the hell is happening with their lives. Then I need to figure out how to give them proper direction so that I make sure that I'm a good manager. And then like one of my biggest failures is, and that's why we had like one of the people actually leave from the company, which was close to my heart and like that I wanted to stay, is you need to figure out a way how people are going to feel safe in saying some of their problems and the problems about a company. Because uh, I was, I think, consistently battling from, hey, I'm a nice guy to I'm a really uh, like strong guy, whatever, nobody can say anything to me. And then like, I'm again a nice guy and I'm again a strong, a strong guy and like just going through that direction. And with time, there is a specific skill set you need to realize in order to people open up and actually say what they need to say to you. And that's what I'm, I, I think I'm going to be learning more and more every time just to make sure that whatever like those people are saying home to their wives, maybe even about me, that I can find a way for them to open up and say that to me and that we can figure out how to solve that problem uh, together into the future. And that's the biggest thing that unlocks the company to go to 100 people, to 150 people, to 200 people, 500 people. I think the managers and CEOs who run those big companies are probably really, really, really good with people and people can tell them anything without feeling bad. And that's what can unlock kind of good things, which can unlock actual problems in your company. And you actually have an action point of, hey, what do I need to do in order to help this person kind of grow into the future? Really awesome advice there. And thank you for being vulnerable about that. I think there's, um, have you heard the phrase, strong back, soft front, wild heart? You ever I heard have, that phrase? I've not, I've not heard that. It's an interesting idea. It's, it's like, it's knowing yourself enough to be able to know where, the lines are that you won't cross, but then it's being like approachable enough that, you know, you, you are someone that people will, will open up to and be willing to say to your face, you know, what they think about you rather than like your real friends, I think, or maybe in this case, real employees or people that you want to, uh, you know, respond to you in a certain way are the ones that will say it to your face rather than bitch about you when they're getting coffee to their colleagues or go home to their, to their partners or whatever. And I think that's, it, it's, it's so, in my opinion, it's very hard to cultivate that type of environment. So how did you learn from this and what things that have you implemented as an agency owner to ensure that people do have the confidence to say to your face, look, I think there's a problem in this company and I think maybe the problem is you or, you know, how, how do you, how do you kind of manage that now? Yeah. So I try to manage that on a weekly, monthly and quarterly basis. So first I have like the company reporting back on managers so that I can also see the real state of how they're managing uh, the company. So like when all of the team members kind of go ahead and write about a specific problem about a manager, I know that. Uh, even if they bitch about it to me, that's like, it's a real problem. We need to solve it. So like getting the feedback from the bottom, then I also have the feedback uh, kind of from them that they can also kind of send feedback over, over to me, uh, which can be in a sense, Hey, uh, every single week I ask them, where can I help you out? Kind of what's the biggest problem you're having? Uh, and I created a really maybe complicated, but whatever reporting system that every single week we have a really unique report for every single one of the departments where we need to go over specific items for every single one of the persons. Like, hey, uh, kind of first, like about your last week, how was it? We set personal goals for every single one of our team members. So they're the ones who are going to be setting their goals. They are also setting their quarterly goals so that it's not me pushing stuff on their throat. It's them actually setting the goals for them and kind of how they want to grow their career. And then afterwards, it's like just me trying to openly ask, did I make a mistake? Uh, like, how are you feeling about a salary? How are you feeling about your progression? Do you know what you need to do? And then kind of maybe even asking questions which are going to put me in a pretty bad situation uh, as a founder, because if somebody's feeling pretty bad about their job and they want to switch it, I need to be ready to ask the question because if they say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, I need to have the burden on me that I probably going to need to figure out somebody else who's going to do the job and help them to, to transition to a different part of the company which is not always fun. And like, sometimes you're just going to avoid the question of realizing somebody is not the right fit for a specific position. 
and then you need to figure out what you need to do when it comes to that. Uh, yeah, so I, I feel like I, I, I also ask consistently, do, I need to, do you need you to hire somebody else? Do you need to hire additional people? Do you need to fire additional people? Do you need me to fire somebody for you? Because people maybe sometimes are not ready for that. They realize that uh, they need to fire somebody, but they don't have the courage. So like they're going to be basically getting advice for me in order to how to do that job properly. Wow. Okay. There's a very intricate system going on. I think uh, uh, maybe listeners would not really realize the full extent to to what an agency owner is when you have a team this big. But it sounds like you're kind of a people manager, life coach, yeah, kind of just all-round people person rather than actually doing the work, you're overseeing the work from, you know, above and kind of just managing uh, expectations as best as possible. One bit of advice that I was given that I think is really powerful is have difficult conversations early. And I'm not sure if that's something that resonates with you where it's like, you know, if you notice something is is wrong, like try and step in and and deal with it before it grows into this big, big volcano of a problem. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, I feel like Sometimes like that's one of the biggest mistakes in my management style also is like I was not doing that on time. And right now, as soon as I notice somebody not doing their job properly, even though I knew they're they were doing their job properly like amazingly well for six months, and then you're gonna really quickly notice that people lose motivation, they don't do their job like for like a month properly. That that's the point where you need to start the trigger and say, Hey, was something pretty like did something bad happen? Did I say something bad? Do you have a lot more workload? How can I help you out? into hire more people or like fire somebody or like, uh, is the growth too fast? Should we slow down? And that's one of the hardest questions. And I feel like every three months with at least one of my managers, I need to have a conversation like that in order to bring them up and to make them feel that this is possible and that they're doing a good job and it's normal that they're going to have problems. Mm-hmm. Just because as the company gets bigger and bigger, every single manager is going to get more and more problems shoved down their throat. It's like, uh, you know, like our CTO has 16 people be- below him. So you can imagine how many problems can occur in a single day with 16 people. I mean, like we have three team leads who are running that, but again, all of those problems need to come to him. And then like, you just kind of need to be like a body on the shoulder to some of the people and say, kind of, Hey, this is normal. Like, I'm not mad at you. I like, uh, I know that you're doing your best, but like, it's just normal to have a lot of problems when you have 16 people developing websites for enterprises every single day. Let's just figure out how to be transparent about it and figure out what the heck do we need to do for that. Yeah. And like, this is, this brings it back to kind of, the real reason why this is so, so critical to, to organize your team and focus on your team happiness, because that obviously affects the client work that's done. And like, you might think, ah, oh, well, no, we need to focus on the clients. Like actually no, focus on your team. And then that is going to help, you know, the, the client work's going to manage itself if the team are happy and feel listened to, feel heard. And then you can also track you know, numbers and profitability and stuff a lot closer if you know who's working on what, how they're doing, you know, if they're, if they're struggling and there's tons of workload from a really difficult client, okay, this project might take longer than we thought. So there are like real business implications to this. You're not just being a nice guy for a nice guy's sake. Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that yeah. you're not a nice guy, yeah. but this is really, really important stuff that, um, if you are someone that's listening to this, thinking about hiring, or maybe you're just a freelancer that's thinking, you know, in the future, I'd really like to have an agency. I aspire to have um, an in-house team or, or an in-house studio. Then I think it's worth listening to these words and trying to, yeah, inhale Urosh's knowledge here. Tell me about failure number three, the office. The office. This is like a selfish thing, which uh, an emotional thing, like, and whenever I make an emotional decision in business, it's usually not good. Uh, just because like from my childhood, I was always like watching suits and stuff like that. And I was like thinking, let me imagine me waking up and like uh, going to the office. And then like, it's a, like this huge office. It looks really nice. Everybody's having five at me. Like, Hey, 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 boss. Hey, 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 whatever. And like, I think I wrote out the, I wrote that on a piece of paper, even like in 2015, And uh, since I was building the studio, building, 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 we had like the whole investment was like around three, uh, around 250, 300 K to get the uh, office set up. And like, because I don't have maybe an emotional connection to money because it's more about like a fun coupon, which is going to allow me to get to the next phase of my life. I was like, Hey, I want to, I have this in my mind. I was, I was thinking about this for the last five years. 
I already made like the last 80 years or whatever. I needed to get it off my shoulders. And then we created a whole, uh, like, uh, uh, we, we created the whole studio, like the whole office space. And I was telling to myself, this is going to make a huge difference in the business. This is going to make like the, the next big thing. I was telling to all of the managers, this is like the next big thing. And I was doing that selfishly just for me. And then it did not change anything. I mean, like, it looks really cool and people still go to the office, but like the previous office was like 2.5K per month. And we did not invest anything in it because like it was fully furnished and like that was like 20K per year versus right now the rent is like really, really high, maybe like 10K per month, like with all the additional expenses. And then like on top of that, we blew a lot of money into the office space just in order for me as a CEO to feel emotionally nice because that was my childhood dream. So that's like one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is like, don't do things out of emotion and just try to like actually rationalize about the decisions. Like, should you do it or not? And even all of my managers told me like, we don't need that. Uh, whatever. I was like, Hey, we're going to do it. No worries. Like your boss is here to, to kind of lift you up or we're going to make it through. And like, there is a bad thing where we blew a lot of money, but also because of that, like last year was really, really stressful because we didn't have like that big of a cushion when it comes to payroll, but that helped us optimize our finances, like to a uh, extension that I would never think about that we optimize our finances because uh, I guess tough, tough times create strong men or whatever. So like we had to kind of worry about every single dollar and like did the client pay, did it not pay or whatever. So that helped us optimize our finances a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot more. And also we, in the process, we opened up a co-working space. So right now we rented half of the building in the process, which then again was more work from my side that probably was supposed to be uh, done towards uh, kind of client work or like teamwork, whatever. But we were able to get out of it with a lesson, but it was also a big mistake that I'm not sure is the lesson actually worth uh, like that amount. But uh, you got to live with what you decide on to, to do. And like, I don't feel bad at it. I never feel bad about things that I've done in my life. I just try to make them better, uh, like to um, to fix them in the end. So that's because th th that's, I guess, why a good thing came out of it, like really nicely optimized finances and a co-working space, which we rent out, which is probably going to cover our costs at zero. But the, the stress uh, last year was probably not worth uh, the, the results we've gotten and the lessons we've learned. Wow. Fascinating. I mean, do you think that you would ever go back to, to just going into a co-working space and like because it seems like you've you've now created something that's you know beautiful building it's fully furnished you could i guess potentially sell that or is that are you looking at this building as like an asset now that you want to to grow in you know just sit on it and as long as you can survive keeping on payroll etc then you'll then you'll be fine yeah, I mean, like from this year, like the last year was hard. This year, that's not going to make an impact, like when it comes to our revenue. So like we, we managed like through the co-working rent and also like through lifting our revenue a lot more be uh, to make sure that that kind of doesn't impact us a lot. I feel like maybe like in the five years period, we we might get downsize and get a smaller, a smaller thing, which is not going to be so expensive just to have a place where people can connect and kind of be together. Uh, so if I would do it again, I would probably not do it, but like with time it's just an asset that we can use for branding, that we can use for clients and like we can use for events to train more people in person and stuff like that. So at least we're going to leverage whatever we invested into it and kind of continue with that. And you've also got your studio space, uh, for your YouTube content, which we haven't even spoken about at all yet. I mean, it's a beautiful space to actually record in and, and, uh, you know, makes you look incredibly professional when it comes to your YouTube content. Tell us a little bit about as a, as an agency founder, you know, you're doing a bazillion things. You seem to be spending a lot of time making content. Why make content? Why are you doing that? I, I think we're living a digital age right now. And like whatever, like even if somebody's VP of marketing, they're going to search on YouTube for Webflow. And when they see your face, they're going to react much differently on a sales call uh, compared to if they don't see your face. So we try to be everywhere. I mean, like we're on Google, we're on YouTube, uh, we guest post, uh, we're on all social media. We uh, like we do podcasts like uh, I do. I speak at events. Uh, I just try to like uh, grant card to have the grant card on 10x, even if you don't need it, like make sure that you're everywhere where people see it, that you basically pop out of their fridge. So I, I do believe it's important and it's a way of educating uh, people before they buy because 97% of people are not ready to buy. And like if they come to your website and leave and never see you again, like they're probably going to forget about your brand. 
versus if they come to your website uh, like once, they see your YouTube, they follow your YouTube for six months, and only after that they decide to convert and actually go ahead and work with your business. I think it's worth it, and I think it's it's a long investment. We recorded 200 videos, uh, but with time you're getting an asset which does sales for your business on your own automatically. Yeah, it's an evergreen evergreen content as well so it's like once you make it once you've got that asset to keep going i I look at youtube videos like assets like it's an asset class that you are investing in and yeah i completely agree i personally am bullish on making content obviously i'm yeah working with with our now maku studio we are really keen on making content too but i wanted to hear from your mouth why you think it's important as an agency owner to spend so much time in there the other thing that i want to talk to you about before we wrap up this episode is data goat and all the other products that you're making you are diversifying all the interesting client projects you've done you've worked with some big clients and now you're like you know what we see all these problems that we actually have the internal capabilities to solve for not just you know other uh, clients but also you as an agency owner and other web flowers in the space Tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about product creation in the Webflow space alongside all the client work that you do. Yeah, so that was also, if we take a look at it from a mistake perspective, that was also one of our biggest mistakes ever. I mean, like into getting the products off the ground, just because when you're doing client work, it's a much different management and like you're getting an ROI directly. And like we basically sabotaged our whole product team into launching everything you're just seeing a lot later because they start working on something that they get a really good idea. And then there is a client willing to pay us 20K and they were like, hey, hmm, you know what? Let's let's go ahead and do that for a bit. And then we're going to think back on the, like our own our, our own thing afterwards. And then like we were jumping and like giving the product like a hot potato. Like somebody, like we know somebody would be a really, really good fit for a client. We move them to the client and then we continue working uh, on the product with somebody else. And then like we worked with agencies to help us work on the product. So it was a real nightmare to organize until we came to a point that I realized, hey, this is something we actually want to spend on, like which might be the future of our studio. And we created a product team of people who we cannot touch I mean, like first. And like we look at it as a different company, like, hey, we have a React developer, we have a Webflow developer, we have a designer, and they work with me and our marketing manager together. And that's a separate team, separate entity that cannot do any client work, that cannot do any other things, and they need to be focused just on building the product. Because it takes so much time, uh, we're, we were doing that for the first time, so people need to learn, they need to get uh, adjusted to the process, how they get feedback, how they improve. So the whole process was fun. We also learned a lot more like as an agency so that later on, if we do any client work of that sort, like we're going to be able to do it much, much, much better. But the idea behind it is first we have DataGoat. As we're an agency which uh, focuses really on business results, we want to have a tool which is going to help clients understand their website a lot better and understand their website without paying a market analyst or like a, like so- something like that. So that based off of that, we try to uh, slowly create a platform which is going to help you see the data you have. And with time, hopefully with AI, also give you some suggestions of what, where are the places on your website where you can fix your website on your own as a website owner without paying an agency or anybody else. Um, just so that you can kind of do simple simple things, add credibility, update things, and like uh, add call to actions and maybe change the call, text and call to actions and stuff like that. So the long-term idea for DataGoat is to be like your marketing buddy. Currently, it's a way to have much more complex analytics inside of Webflow, which nobody, I think, else offers. And it's completely for free for everybody to go ahead and try and see their website, see their form submissions, the conversion rates on their form submissions, see where people click on their website, and have that all in like in our dashboard, in the Webflow dashboard, and also as an email newsletter every single week. Wow, awesome. Go check out DataGo, guys, if you haven't already. It's in the Webflow app marketplace and uh, it's well worth checking out. But it's interesting to hear, Uros, that you've had such a, it's such a mindset shift when you do product stuff compared to client work. And I noticed that when I was working at Egg Rallon with Slater, you know, there's like designers that are kind of in and out of, of being able to work on it because there's, there's client work, which takes precedence. Um, and then it's 
actually a lot more expensive and time consuming than you think to make a product as well is something that yeah maybe you found <laughs> as well as you as paying, you developed it paying three people full time every single month times 12 can come out to be a real cost per year like looking at the like investment in the product itself so yeah it's something you don't think about but salaries are also at, exp- at expense but it's also fun like with that team we're able to leverage data goat and also six star as our whole studio is run on a no code app called six star where we have a client relations platform and we try to basically create all sops with software so that when a client sends in like uh basically a request we have a specific set of tasks which happen on the back end automatically to our account manager project manager ceo cto and stuff like that when our developers finish tasks we have checklists integrated inside of the platform and like many more things like that which actually help us run our business better which is a pretty fine time to be in because like previously that would require probably millions of investments and right now we can build it with no code uh, and one team in, in the end. Yeah, it's it's wild what you've built internally and then and now you can actually productize what you've what you've learned as you go. So um and six stars really interesting, but we don't have too much time to talk about this. Are you ready for your final question Arash? Yes, let's go. What is your next failure going to be? Our next failure? That's going to be fun. Uh, I guess we're starting to do outbound for the first time in our lives because like everything came inbound till now. Like we were focusing on content, like the content strategy and like just making sure that we deliver the best possible service. And the only outbound we've done was through partnerships. So that I don't count that as outbound. Like if you have a partnership with a company or like with, with a friend from US and stuff like that. So right now we're going to uh, hire probably four salespeople. Like this is gonna be our uh, gonna right now. We try to not do things small, but like let's go ahead and like if we're doing something and testing it for a year, let's do it fully. So like we're gonna be hiring four additional four salespeople like in the next month or so, and then trying to figure out how can we organize our sales outbound strategy in a way which is actually gonna make sense. Uh, as we want to make sure that like we have like inbound leads and that the sales team can be another source of inbound leads and that they can kind of schedule meetings kind of with our AEs and stuff like that. So we're probably going to fail a lot. We're probably going to spend a lot more time than needed and blow a lot of money, but it's it's going to be fun because I feel like when we unlock the outbound sales part, that's going to make us limitless in terms of kind of figuring out, hey, we want to scale to this amount of people. We just need to expand the sales team. The sales team is going to do X amount of things. They're going to bring in the people and like we're going to be able to scale the team further. Nice. So inbound and outbound sales. Wow. Where do you want Flow Ninja to end up? To end up? Uh, it's, it's, I, I haven't think about that a lot. Uh, I, I stopped telling you about the process because I just enjoy figuring out what's going to be the next thing. And then like I have like the process for a year that they need to work on. But I guess in the end, I want to uh, end up in a company which is going to, not generational, but uh, like with a company which can work on it. Like even if I step down as a CEO, can continue working which is going to require a lot of work, but it's also going to be pretty fun to figure out how to get to a point where maybe at one point we're not going to be even reliant only on Webflow. We're going to be able to add more services uh, kind of to the studio itself so that we can kind of grow further and that we can actually help clients grow their businesses from all different perspectives, not just from the web design point, because I do strongly believe that we can help them in many different areas. But that probably requires a kind of generational company, which requires a lot more processes, a lot more people, a lot more things in place. But it's, uh, I, I guess I have a long life in front of me to make that happen. Hey, what a beautiful way to end the podcast. Arash, thank you so much for coming on Webflow and sharing as vulnerably as you have. Thank you for the invitation. And this was incredibly fun to for me to go ahead and discuss about these topics. Thanks, dude.